delighted to be here and to talk about the new new developments that we've been working on at the USGS. Um, and I, I like to start by saying, what is my driving philosophy in doing all of this kind of work? And this is a quote from somebody else, you'll find out in a minute who it is, that the only way to figure out what is happening to our planet is to measure it, and this means tracking changes decade after decade, and that's the, the duration is extremely important, and pouring over the records. And I would argue that we often forget that part, which is it's not, it's terribly important and terribly difficult to collect the data, but pouring over the records to extract the meaning from them is critical. And what I'm presenting today is really an evolutionary step in ways of analyzing the data that is designed particularly for some of the very, very rich uh, data sets that we have in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, particularly the rim sites. Uh, and uh, the quote, by the way, is from Ralph Keeling, the son of David Keeling, who was the person who created the CO2 monitoring at Mauna Loa, arguably the single most important environmental science record uh, of our modern age. Um, the paper, I just mentioned it here, if you want to find, it's available, open online access. If you just Google WRTDS comma Hirsch, you'll find it immediately. It apl we applied this methodology to total phosphorus and dissolved nitrate plus nitrite at each of the nine river input monitoring sites. That data set that was used in this consists of over 13,000 chemical measurements and 100,000 daily stream flow measurements over 31 years. And I just want to acknowledge the incredible amount of hard work and dedication of the USGS hydrologists and hydrotechs and some people from other agencies to go out rain or shine uh, over that 31 year period and collect this incredibly uh, wonderful uh, body of data. So what's the main idea? The idea is to take the data that we have to describe the evolving behavior of entire watersheds. So we measure the, Patux, the, the, the Susquehanna River at Conowingo. It's, it's our opportunity to see what's that system and how it's behaving. We sample the water quality only once every couple weeks. Uh, what we want is to get a, a picture of the behavior of the system by teasing that out of the data set that, we, that we've collected. We want to use it to create an estimated daily record of concentrations and fluxes at, at these monitored locations. So we don't have daily, we have daily flows, but we don't have daily concentrations. We need to use the information in there to infer what those concentrations are, and when we have concentrations, we simply multiply them by flow to get a flux or load uh, on a daily basis. Um, we also want to create an estimated record that is free of the effects of the random year-to-year -year variations in stream flow, and we call this a flow normalized record, and I'll get back to this in a minute, in a few minutes when I sort of walk you through the methodology. But we recognize that the year-to-year -year variations in the, in the weather uh, are very influential in terms of the water quality in these tributaries, and we don't want to be fooled by what happens to be a kind of a roll of the dice in terms of what particular set of conditions that we had, we again want to get at what's the behavior of the system and how is that changing. And for that, we really need to flow normalize. And we want to provide diagnostic information. It's not enough to just say there's an uptrend, there's a downtrend, it's 5% over so many years. We'd like to use this analysis to give us some insight on what's going on and why that can help managers of water quality get, get the right focus in terms of what needs to be fixed. How does it work? The idea is to mathematically decompose the sample data into four components. The first one is seasonal variation. There's a lot of seasonal variation in these water quality variables. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of stream flow driven variation. Uh, uh, for example, if we have um, non-point source loading associated with runoff, we're going to see high concentrations at high flow, low concentrations at low flow. These are all these patterns. We need to be able to incorporate that into our model. There is long-term trend. and I, To me, it's a given that there is always long-term trend. Humans are doing lots of things out there for good or ill in the watershed, and there is a long-term pattern of trend. We need to incorporate that. And then we need to recognize that there is a great deal of random or unexplained variation, and we need to do that. The, the human eyeball is not able to parse apart, apart 
these different components of, of the variation, you need a formal mathematical approach. But before I show you the formal mathematical approach, I want to show you a simplified sort of eyeball approach that at least gets us at two of the questions, which is long-term trend and, uh, and stream flow driven variation. So this is a graphic that's based on all of the data from uh, 1978 through 2009, I believe, for the Patuxent River near Bowie, Maryland for total phosphorus. Now, I use this as a poster child. This is the most substantial trend we see anywhere in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and that's because major investments were made in point source control. But because this is a really strong trend, it makes a good opportunity to illustrate the way this approach works. So what is this graph? I call it a stacked, uh, um, a stacked data graph. I've sub separated the, the samples that we've collected. There's some 700 or so observations here. And I've separated them into, into four classes. So the, the one at the bottom of this graph is, has a, were at discharges that were between 0 and 150 cubic feet per second. That's the lowest quartile of daily flows over this period of record. The second one is 150 through 230 CFS. That's the second quartile of flow. And so on up in the top graph is the higher flows, the highest 25% of flows. It's not, by the way, the highest 25% of sampled flows. It's the highest 25% of all flows that occurred, all the daily flows over this 31-year <coughs> period. Well, what immediately jumps out is if you look at the bottom graph, you see this enormous downtrend that started at the beginning of the record in 78 and runs through, say, the early 1990s, with concentrations arguably coming down uh, from around one, one to one and a half milligrams per liter of total phosphorus down to a range of, of uh, a few tenths um, or even sub-tenth of a milligram per liter, an enormous trend at this level. And the same thing can be said for the next level, uh, right here, uh, and by the way, those are just, just smoothers, it's a low S smooth if you know that mathematics. Um, and the second one it doesn't look terribly different, although you'll notice in this range of flow, the highs are not nearly as high as they are here. These highs are so high is because at low flow, in those early years, the river flow was very much made up of treatment plant effluent, and that's why they reflected such high numbers. As we get up to the next higher flow class, we see them coming down, but we still see this general trend, uh, a great improvement to 1990 and fairly flat after that. But finally, when we get to the highest flow class, the indication of trend becomes a lot murkier. There's probably a little bit of a downtrend, but not very much. The point is, trend can be quite different depending on what kind of flows that you're looking at. And a picture like this can immediately diagnose that we've had a lot of improvement because of point source control. It doesn't seem that we're seeing much uh, change in behavior at the higher flows in recent years. Uh, and maybe if we're trying to get some more improvement, that may be the area to work on. So we can take, let me go back, we can take this information from these samples and we can, uh, through a mathematical smoothing process, uh, try to describe um, the way this river behaves from a total phosphorus perspective. This is essentially a contour plot of the expected value of concentration of total phosphorus for any day, for any discharge. In this particular case, I've run the graph from 1978 through 1983, a period in which there was a lot of change going on in this system, and the bright colors represent the highest concentrations. So what it's telling us is that in the summertime, at very low flows, we have these very high concentrations up there in the neighborhood of 1.3 to 1.5 milligrams per liter. And as the flow gets higher, or as we move away from the summertime, the concentrations uh, tend to get lower. And this pattern gradually morphs over time. And the mathematics ensures that the kind of the right degree of smoothness to this picture. We can then go to, the, to 1991 through 96, and in fact you can hardly see any variation here, 
the, the purple colors have completely gone away because we've gotten rid of those high concentrations happening at the very low flows and we can still see a seasonal pattern with it being just a little bit higher in the summertime than it is at the fall but uh, generally that's the pattern and we can go on one step farther and there's this is 2004 through 2009 and now when we get down here in this very low flow range um, uh, no matter what time of year it is we're down in this lowest class of concentration values and we can in fact put those three three snapshots of this surface together one at a time one after the other and in a sense visualize what's going on in terms of the changes in water quality so so this is a, a diagnostic and it's a way of visualizing what's going on what the method actually does is mathematically go into the surface and say okay I want to estimate what happened on April 20th of 1979 uh, and I can look up and say oh the discharge was so many cubic feet per second and I can go in here and I can pick off my estimate of the expected value of concentration on that particular day then move to the next day do it again do it again do it again and by that process create my best estimate of the concentration on every single day of that 31 year period. Now there's a lot of unexplained variance and hence the record that would, you would come out with is going to be rather smoothly behaving because we've left that out but what we're interested here is, a, is in the expected value. So we can take those concentrations for every single day, multiply them by the discharge for those days to compute a flux for that day. In this case it's in, expressed in units of tons per day um, and we can sum them over individual months and the black line on this graph is that estimated history of, of fluxes over this period of record and the, and the red circles are uh, the annual estimates. We simply add up the numbers for all 365 days of each year and, and show them on the graph. And what we see is, and, and this is not rocket science, it's clear that we had some tremendous fluxes back in the 70s and they have come down into a much more, uh, much lower range in recent years. Now I'm going to strip away the monthly and just show you the annual. So these are the exact same red dots I just showed you but I just expanded the axis so that uh, you can see it better and so you see the tremendous downwards trend, great success but then you see some other things that, that make you wonder how are we doing in the Patuxent? Well this is 1996, an extremely wet year this is 2003, an extremely wet year and these are 1999 through 2002, a series of extremely dry years clearly the phosphorus pattern, total phosphorus pattern is very much influenced by high and low flow and so we can end up in situations we see this over and over and over again as we look at the records for the bay is if, if our window is too tight in terms of looking at the data you know we could look at this 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 and this and say aha we're having tremendous success the number is going down I would argue no you've been tremendously lucky the roll of the dice has been that we haven't had any whopper wet years since then but I will guarantee you it'll happen again or we could look from here to here and say oh my god we're having a terrible failure as we go out of the drought and into that wet period we need some way to get past this uh, really false conclusions about success or failure that are simply a result of the random roll of the dice of what kind of weather did we get so we develop this idea which I call flow normalization and the goal is to remove the variation due to the random variations in flow but be true to the behavior of the system. How do we do that? For any given day of the study period we compute what, what would have happened on that day with each one of the 31 different daily discharges that, that happened on that day of the year in the past. So I'm saying the flow for that particular day was a random occurrence and I'll use the 31 years of, of data for that day of the year as my population that I'm going to sample from uh, uh, but I'm going to say but my model, that contour plot 
tells me how the system was behaving on that day. So I'm using that contour plot and going in there for every single day I'm going in there 31 times, 31 different flow, flow values. So then I'm comp computing concentrations for all of those, multiplying them by flow to get a flux, and then averaging them to get a flow normalized daily flux, and then averaging them over the year, uh, and that's the flow normalized average flux for the year. And this is what the result looks like. So this is the exact same set of red dots that I showed you a couple slides ago, but I've superimposed on it the set of annual values of this flow normalized flux. Um, it, by definition, it's going to be smooth. Uh, it's not going to have those year-to-year -year variations that are due to flow variation. Um, it's really going to represent something about the overall pattern of, of change. And I should just comment one caveat with this is if there was a watershed in which a very uh, abrupt major change took place, there's one big treatment plant and it underwent a major enhancement, this will tend to smooth it out more than it ought to be and that the absolutely sudden jump w wouldn't be seen immediately, it'll only be seen eventually. But I think most of the changes we anticipate in these large watersheds are either combinations of many point source actions or combinations of a huge number of, of non-point source actions and I think the smoothness is, is an appropriate way to look at things. Now we can say some things about well, what's the trend in my, and I, it was interesting to hear the previous conversation about how to depict trend to people because it matters enormously over what period of time you describe the trend. Is it the trend from 1995 to, to now? The answer is it's pretty much flat. If it's about the trend from 1978 to now, the answer is enormous amount of change and we can describe that either in tons per year or we can describe it in percent. We have a lot of options about how we want to go about displaying that information. Couple more, couple more rivers. I'm not going to develop all the way through, but I think I want to just show other diagnostic patterns. So this is exactly the same kind of plot that I showed you for the Patuxent. This is also total phosphorus. It's the Rappahannock. It's four flow classes from lowest to highest. We look at the lowest flow class the total phosphorus concentrations are very, very low and they're very flat, basically no change in this system over the entire record. We go up to the second flow class, uh, it's a little noisier, but there's nothing in there that would indicate that anything's really changing. And even the, the third quartile of flow, again, a little bit noisier because we're getting into more moderately high flow events, so things are a little bit more variable. But again, not anything that I would call a strong indication of a trend. But then when we get into the highest flow class, we see some real change occurring. We see some whopping big concentration values out here. And interestingly, we see the disappearance of any, what I'll call really low concentrations of total phosphorus when we're in that flow class. So back here in the mid-90s, uh, at high flow, we went from very low to very high. It would appear that now we're going from, at that same flow class, we're going kind of from moderate to high. Um, I think, and we've looked at an additional year of data and we see this, this kind of pattern persisting. One more example, now we're switching over to talking about dissolved nitrate plus nitrite. This is the Chop Tank River, same scheme again. If we look at the lowest flow class, 0 to 30 cubic feet per second, we have this consistent upwards march of nitrate concentrations over this entire 31-year period. It's about a 50% increase over that period of time. We look at the next flow class, 30 to 80 uh, CFS, the same pattern persists, about a 50% increase, and we see it in the third flow class, the third quartile they're all marching upwards. When we finally get to the highest flow class, uh, the, the pattern is not nearly as clear, it's much noisier, and not something that we would call a, a strong and distinct sort of a trend. What does this pattern tell us? It tells me immediately this is about groundwater, because groundwater is what dominates the flow in these flow classes, and nitrate is in the groundwater. We know that nitrate is increasing in the groundwater over this period of time, 
and this is clearly a groundwater driven signal and that surface runoff occurring at high flows is not necessarily changing very much it's the groundwater component that's changing so we have different products for different purposes we can talk about concentration we can talk about flux we can talk about the actual history what occurred and the flow normalized history and these little three cartoons will give a, an idea of when you would use which of these approaches to looking at it. If you were an ecologist or water, an estuarine ecologist looking at this system and say, I want to know about the fluxes because I want to test my model or my idea about how the estuary functions, you want the actual flow history, the fact that there was a lot of phosphorus in O3 and not very much in O2. You want to know the actual history to support that science. If you were a manager of, the water, of a watershed feeding to the bay, uh, you want to know the flow normalized flux history. You want to know how are we doing at changing the behavior of this watershed uh, rather than being worried about what happened in each individual year. And finally, if your interest was, say, in the tidal Potomac or the tidal Patuxent or what have you, you want to know about the water that's going through that system you'd be more interested in the concentration history. So there's a variety of products that one would want to look at depending on what one's goal is. So we can summarize the results for these nine sites, in this case for total phosphorus, I translated it into yield, so it's kilograms per day per square kilometer, and we can immediately see a variety of things, including this tremendous Patuxent downtrend stands out very, very strongly, that Rappahannock uptrend stands out, and a lot of other features, including getting a sense of which ones are high, which ones are low, which ones are changing a lot, which ones are highly variable from year to year in terms of discharge. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, this is the Susquehanna. I haven't shown you the data, but this is the TMDL load allocation for the Susquehanna, essentially, at Conowingo. The annual loads, or fluxes, by my methodology, are in the blue there, and what you see is from time to time we get at or just below that TMDL, but the flow normalized load is going down and beginning to rise back up again. Um, moving to nitrate plus nitrite, um, again, the flow normalized is the solid line. The, uh, the individual estimates for the years are in the, in the circles. Uh, the chop tank stands out as distinctly different from anything else in the watershed and that's because of this groundwater contribution and the ever-increasing amount of nitrate in the groundwater. Uh, and we can see some of the sites, like the Pamunkey and the Appomattox, being much, much lower than anything else. And the, some of the basins that have a lot of agriculture in them, like the Susquehanna and the Potomac, standing as being fairly high, but fortunately trending down somewhat in recent years. So where are we going next with this technique? We're going to expand the analysis to looking at total nitrogen, at dissolved phosphorus, at suspended sediments. Um, we, we, we hope to compare the outputs of this approach to the watershed model to try to understand where they're similar and where they're different and to, in hopes that we can help improve the watershed model. We want to add the a look at upstream sites that have fairly long records, say in excess of 20 years, and begin to learn about differences between sites. Uh, and explore the connections between the results that we see here and the driving variables in the watershed, including the time lags, because many of these things uh, happen not immediately, but after some lag. And we want to see if these characterizations can help lead to a more comprehensive history of eastern shore inputs to the bay, both for nitrogen and for phosphorus, and I'm convinced that dissolved phosphorus in the subsurface is an important component of the Bay story. Uh, and we only have this tiny little watershed, the upper part of the chop tank, that has this kind of a long-term record. Can we use that and other records to help generalize across the eastern shore? Uh, and then we need to make the approach operational with frequent updates and user-selected information products, and we have some ideas about how to do that. And I'll just go back to my original quote to end with, the only way to figure out what is happening to our planet is to measure it. And we've been doing this one for 32 years now. This means tracking changes decade after decade and pouring over the records, which I would argue is the real, a more, a very important scientific challenge for all of us. And I'll take questions. Thank you.